He was an All-American as a player, a national champion as a coach, but his sexual addiction cost him his job in the NBA. So all along the way, I'm thinking, you know, how in the world have I, have I done this? How have I destroyed my career and possibly my whole family, my marriage, everything, and now having to drive home and put those in terms that my wife um, could accept. And we all know that that's not an acceptable thing for any wife or any marriage. Winston Bennett is fighting for his life on this edition of the Red and Blue Review, presented by the Winton Law Group. The Red and Blue Review is brought to you by the Winton Law Group and by the Bachman Auto Group, Home Run Burgers and Fries, Sam Swope, and by SWAT Team Pest Control. We welcome you to the Red and Blue Review. Gary Gupton here. We have uh, reconfigured our studio and traded away one of our guys, and it's because he's a big star. Say hello to Daryl Bird of the Cats Balls. You, yeah, right. But Daryl's not the reason we had to redo the set. Welcome, DB. Yeah, I appreciate it, sir. Got rid of Howie. Major, major upgrade today. Big upgrade. We've got uh, one of the all-time greats, uh, not only at the University of Kentucky, but also high school basketball here across the Commonwealth. Winston Bennett joins us from uh, Mayfield, Kentucky now. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. And why Winston is here is he's got a new book out called Fight for Your Life, and we're going to dig through uh, some of the morsels of your college basketball career, your high school and professional basketball career. And we're going to start out, Winston, I want to talk to you about when you were coming out of high school, uh, there were a lot of schools who were interested in Winston Bennett out of male high school, Kentucky, Louisville, Georgetown, Indiana. But the battle here mostly was fought between Kentucky and Louisville, right? It came down to those guys? Yeah, it really did. And, you know, I grew up a, a huge Louisville fan. Mm -hmm. uh, Daryl Griffith was kind of the Michael Jordan of the age for a lot of us young guys coming up. And I can remember him being the first guy I ever see do a 360 de degree yeah. dunk. And I immediately said to myself, man, I want to be like that. I want to be a Cardinal just like him. But apparently you didn't want it badly enough because you, you, you kind of – tell me the story about what happened the night that you came in for your visit and it did not go exactly like Louisville had hoped. <laughs> well, I came into a visit and uh, Robbie Valentine was mm -hmm. my host and uh, he had taken me out, shown me the campus, and I think there was a campus party that night. And uh, he, along about 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, we're, we're back in the dorms and uh, a big blue van rolls up. You know, Robbie's back at his dorm, I'm back at mine, <laughs> and, and, and I get whisked away by the Big Blue Faithful. Well, the next morning, uh, Coach Denny Crum has this breakfast set up for us, and, mm -hmm. you know, Robbie goes in, and Coach Crum says, well, where's Winston? And, of course, Robbie goes on to tell him, well, about 3 a.m. in the morning, we saw this Big Blue van roll up, and we hadn't <laughs> seen him since. <laughs> Now, that's Winston's version of what happened. <laughs> We're going to tell you what really happened. This at least is Robbie Valentine's version of the kidnapping of Winston Bennett. <laughs> when Winston Bennett came to the University of Louisville, um, he's a high school, all-American all from Mel High School, and we had him in on his official visit. And uh, it was really funny because it was Friday night. We all get ready to go take, take him to dinner and show him a really, really good time. We had all the other recruits ready to go. We get back to the executive inn and go pick up uh, Winston. We, we talked to him earlier and everything was great. We took him back to a shower. We get back to the hotel room. He didn't answer the door. So you're thinking, the guy's either dead or he went home. We opened up the door. He was gone. Big <laughs> clothes and everything. Seriously, you, you were gone. <laughs> I was gone. I was gone. And it was, it was nothing, you know, about Louisville. It was just that I was so intrigued with the fanaticism of the people from Lexington and this whole UK aura surrounding that program. Right. Yeah, and uh, to continue the story a little bit, Robbie Valentine, as Winston just menaced, uh, mentioned, he had the responsibility of breaking the news to Denny Crum, the future Hall of Famer, that Winston <laughs> Bennett had stood him up. <laughs> they was the support, but we didn't tell Coach Crum Friday night that he bolted on us. We waited, we waited till we got the breakfast at Denny's house, and Coach Crum said, where's Winston? Uh, Coach, um, he, 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 he left. 
<laughs> what do you mean he left? He went home. Well, we made it look like he went home Saturday morning. Winston bolted on us on Friday night. He was only in town for at least he was in that hotel for two hours. <laughs> Classic stories of uh, what it's like when it's battling between Kentucky and Louisville for basketball talent. And one of the reasons why they were so interested in Winston Bennett, it amazed me when I read your book that you were the most valuable player of the McDonald's All-Star Game. Winston, that is incredible. Yeah, very blessed to have been uh, you know, one of the top players and to, to then go out and prove it. Mm -hmm. uh, because during that time, you had some highly sought after players. One that really comes to mind was Pearl Washington, out of, yep. who eventually went to Syracuse and had a great career. Uh, but to you know, go in a game like that and have a great game, uh, it was just phenomenal, and you know, I, I look back on a lot of this and say, wow, did I really accomplish those things? Mm -hmm. One of the things you did accomplish that has become uh, somewhat legendary is the fact that you walked off the court and left Charles Barkley sobbing. <laughs> Tell us that story. We need to get that story to, uh, <laughs> to, to the network that he's on now uh, because he probably, that's not what he wants to remember, yeah. but that was when we was in the SEC tournament played at Vanderbilt, and and of course, uh, Charles, known as back during that time, as the round mound of rebound. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was often said that Charles had most big guys in our league uh, frightened, particularly Mel Turpin, who was on mm -hmm. our team, and Sam Bowie at that time that was on our team. But those two guys showed up in a big way uh, during that evening. And of course, we were able to go on and, and to beat Sir Charles and, and his team, uh, the Auburn Tigers. Uh, another great uh, moment from your past that you probably just as soon forget, the one Final Four you got to play in was maybe the worst half of basketball in U.K. history when you guys went against Georgetown oh. and hit only three of 33. You had to bring that I got up. to. Oh, my gosh. What was behind that? I mean, I wish I knew. I, it's still a, a, a phenomenon that none of us can explain. You know, we always say that, you know, someone during halftime uh, put, put something over the rims halftime unbeknownst to us mm -hmm. because when you come out and you have two seven footers that during that time was unheard of yeah. could step out and shoot the medium range shot could post you up on the inside then we had a kid uh, Jim Masters who could hit the three-point shot Dickie Bill was quick as lightning and nobody could throw in a shot I think me and James were probably one of the only two that were able to hit a shot mm -hmm. uh, during that second half run of you know 11 percent shooting or whatever it was. Now, maybe you can explain that the three for 33 came up at this year's Final Four in Houston yeah. because Kentucky was yeah. so cold they kept oh, saying, it was it's deja like, vu. What was it like for you it watching was really, UK? It was deja vu seeing it all over again my mind immediately yeah. reflected you know reflected back to 1984 and you know we were what I call sleepless in Seattle yeah. you know as if we had stayed out or something the night before which we didn't you know everybody was thinking man this is our opportunity yeah. to seize the moment to grasp a final four to play hopefully to go on to play in the championship game I would think you would recognize the the frustration the anguish on the players faces the oh coaches, absolutely. whenever they cut to them you absolutely I, I hurt for them yeah. you know when I saw that occurring because you know I had been there now, you never got back to the Final Four again as a player, right. but the team that you could have gone to, the University of Louisville, ended oh. up winning a national championship in 86. Oh, now, man. That, that couldn't have set well with you. <laughs> that haunts me still to this <laughs> day, you know, knowing that I'm a, you know, a, a prodigy uh, from here, right here in Louisville, and had an opportunity to play for the Hall of Fame coach, Denny Crum, who is well-respected, who I love dearly. Um, and, and could have been a part of that championship run. They run it in 80 with Daryl Griffith while I was mm -hmm. in high school, my idol, you know, as a young player, and then for them to come back in 86 to win it again with Billy Tom Thompson, mm -hmm. Never Nervous Purvis, and uh, all those guys, Herbert Crook, you know, guys that I played with during the summer. You know, at Belknap Gym, you know, we would be running games during the summer. Um, and another one that I'd like to bring up that, you know, wasn't a part of that team but was a mentor to me, and that's Derek Smith. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned about with uh, Coach Crum, you could have played for that team. Yes. Denny would have loved to have had you on that team. In fact, he says when you start counting the greatest players in Commonwealth basketball history, you got to include Winston Bennett. Wow. Oh, tough, hard-nosed kid. I mean, just a physical, uh, very physical player, very intelligent player. Uh, one of those guys that uh, had size and athletic ability and, and quickness and, and a mental approach to the game that was second to none. He, he double tough. As old as you are and as much as you've been there and you've played professionally, what, what does it mean watching a Denny Crum talk about you that way? I'm going to tell you, you know, as tough as I'm supposed to be, yeah. I'm a very sensitive <laughs> guy. My eyes started to well up a little bit. 
because who could have thought of being a young player from right here in Louisville, Kentucky, that a legendary coach like Denny Crum would think that about yeah. me? I mean, that's, I mean, I, I, I don't have words for that. Winston's career did go on uh, from the college game to play professionally. Uh, in fact, the first start he got in the NBA as a Cleveland Cavalier came against Michael Jordan. <laughs> and in the first quarter, you held Michael Jordan to? Four points. Four points. I mean, you know, that'll go down in the annals of history. I would defy anybody to go back in the annals of Michael Jordan's career and see where he was held to four points. So you go into the halftime locker room. Cleveland and Winston leading the world champion Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan by 10 points. And in the second half, Michael Jordan put up how many on you? 65. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that you'd stop the story at halftime. Oh, you goodness. know, I was leading. I had him, you know, four points. We're up 10. Couldn't we just have stopped the game at that point? 65, Winston. You know, I, what can I say? I mean, yeah. that's, but, but here's the great thing about that. As when I also look back at the annals of time, he's done that to just about every yeah. player he's played against. So it's not such a bad thing. It, I think the greatest thing that I look at upon that era and that time is a little kid from Louisville, Kentucky, making mm -hmm. it to the big leagues and having an opportunity to play against one of the world's greatest players. Did Michael say anything to you at all as you were holding him to four points and then as he put up whatever, 60-something He was points? quiet when I hit him at four. But yeah. when we came out at <laughs> halftime, our eyes met I always say, yeah. I didn't know what that look meant, but I soon found out in the second gotcha. half as he went on to blitz us. Right. Well, with all the success Winston had, he did have a secret that sabotaged that success, and we'll start getting into that when we come back. But as we head to break, here's how to get your copy of this book. It's Winston Bennett's Fight for Your Life. You can order it online. We'll be right back here on the Red and Blue Review. And I'm still upset with him. But you know what? Each player gets a little money in their pocket when you take the recruit. I, took, I kept his money. <laughs> that wasn't in the book. Valentine <laughs> telling us what's in Winston Bennett's book. It's called Fight for Your Life. Great book.
Thank you. Uh, it is a, an incredible read because it talks not only about Winston's successes, but also some of his shortcomings and setbacks. And one of them, Winston, uh, you deal very clearly about your issue with sexual addiction. Yes. And I want to pick up the story. Uh, after his playing career was over, he coaches as an assistant coach with Rick Bettino at Kentucky. Rick goes to Boston and takes you with him. So here you are, a young man, as an assistant coach in the NBA, but you blew it. Well, you know, first of all, I've got to give a lot of homage and respect to my mentor, Rick Pitino, mm -hmm. for even trusting in me and having enough faith in me to take him, take me with him. One of his big hangups with NBA, former NBA players was he didn't think they worked hard. Well, you know, that was what I built my reputation on, was working hard. But the, one of the things that I wasn't managing was my private life. Uh, I had a horrible private life in terms of, you know, sex was really a... a a medication for me. It was something that I ran for whenever I was having problems in my life. I felt sex was the medication mm -hmm. uh, for any rejection, for anything that was going negative in my life. So, uh, as I understand, you, you tell the story, your folks are getting ready to come into Boston for a visit, yes. and you get a call one morning from Rick Patino, and you say, when Rick calls you early, it's never good news. So no. pick up the story from there. Yeah, I mean, he uh, it was about six in the morning. We were uh, always supposed to be in the office at six or a little before six, and you know, I always tell the story, too, that, you know, it's always said that the, the real estate mogul, Donald Trump, made it famous by saying on his show, you're fired. Mm -hmm. Well, Coach Patino made that famous years later <laughs> yeah. with me, firing me every day. But um, one morning, one morning in particular, and it happened to be the day that my parents were coming in, I got the call from Coach Patino, and he asked me the question, have you been sleeping with a young lady on Brandeis campus? And you know, I wasn't one to lie about something like that, and I immediately, well, not immediately, after I could think of nothing else, mm -hmm. said yes. And then at that point, he had to say, you've just jeopardized uh, our contract to practice at the school. We was only allowed to come and practice, and then was to be off the campus, and I had jeopardized that. So then you had to go home, tell your wife and your family that you'd just been fired from essentially a dream job. Yeah, I mean, it was a 45-minute drive from where we live to where we practice. So all along the way, I'm thinking, you know, how in the world had, have I done this? How have I destroyed my career and possibly my whole family, my marriage, everything, and now having to drive home and put those in terms that my wife um, could accept? And we all know that that's not an acceptable thing for any wife or any marriage. Rick Pitino said that this was a, a young man that he certainly had no intentions of wanting to fire. Winston's a really good person. Um, um, I wish he would have uh, not been as quite as open as he's been, but everybody chooses a different path. Um, it's a way of cleansing uh, oneself, and he wanted to do it that way, and that's fine. I support it. Winston, why are you so transparent in this book about your sexual indiscretions? It all has to do with, with my upbringing of believing in Christ, and I feel like that we go through things for a reason. How can we help other people unless at some point when we've surmised the issue and got it under wraps, unless we're able to talk about it and tell someone else about it that may possibly be going through it themselves. So my whole premise for doing this is so that I can reach back and help others who have been struggling with sexual addiction. Have you heard from others since the book's countless, been Countless, really? countless of young men and surprisingly young women that struggle with this issue hmm. called sex addiction. The, the can't help it, you know, where you've just got to have it. And, and that's what's been the blessing to me and also my wife is the fact that we're able to help other people. I, I have to be more than just a basketball coach. And I, and I praise God for giving me this career. But there's more to me than that. And I know that I'm here for a purpose, and my purpose is to help other people. And when you go through something as heinous as I've been through and my wife has been through, knowing that 50% of marriages end in divorce over one infidelity. And here I have a rap sheet of infidelities mm -hmm. and my wife has stayed with me. That's something that I need to tell someone else who's struggling in the issue, whose marriage is struggling and on the verge of divorce, I can tell them, hey, there's means to stay together. There's a reason for you guys to stick together. Winston, in this culture where athletes like yourself are put on a pedestal, uh, a guy with your weakness the weakness that all of us as men have sure. towards sex, it would seem to me like you guys have more of an opportunity than the rest of the population to act out on those fantasies. You know, one of the big things that happened that all broke this for me was the Tiger Woods scandal mm -hmm. about a year ago. 
And you're exactly right. When you're put or placed in the public eye, your platter becomes full with opportunities and it becomes um, mandated, so to speak, that you have the type of boundary set up that will prevent you from going down those lines. And oftentimes the boundary is if I've been burned enough you know, by this thing, at some point I need to take a look at my life and take inventory and say, hey, that doesn't work. I need to change the path that I'm going down. Well, he did not go down this path alone. He had a wife beside him and a God in front of him. And those are two big issues of why Winston Bennett got through this. We'll start exploring that part of the story when we come back on the Red and Blue Review. Again, talking Winston Bennett about his book, Fight for Your Life. Here's how you can get your copy. And we will be right back on the Red and Blue Review. Welcome back to the Red and Blue Review. Again, we're talking with Winston Bennett about his book, Fight for Your Life, and we're joined by his wife of over 20 years now, Peggy Jones Bennett. And Peggy, tell me what was the toughest part of this as a wife to deal with, knowing that Winston for so many times and for so many years had been unfaithful to you? Well, I think that what's, what was more difficult was finding out that it was in fact an addiction. Mm -hmm. Um, because we often, you know, have been told that addictions, uh, not everybody can pull out of an addiction and it just continues on and on for some people. So looking at it like that, I thought he may never change, you know, and hmm. what am I going to do about that? Uh, because I feel like that in order for a person to change in, in an addictive role, there's a whole lot of work involved with that. So I was real concerned. What kept you going as you were going through this? The Lord. Mm -hmm. And I say that, um, that was the first. I mean, that's the, that's the ultimate thing was God. And certainly I had a tremendous support system. Um, I had godly people uh, that were uh, not judging me, 
uh, not telling me that uh, this is not something you should do, but rather supporting me in my decision to obey God. What do you think is the, the lesson that perhaps your story can be overlaid in the lives of other people who are watching this that are going through something perhaps similar? I really feel like that we all have to get to a place um, that we're willing to look at the whole picture of a person's life. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one time Coach Patino saying to us that uh, Winston was 98% a good man, but it was the 2% of his lifestyle that was destroying his life. Well, 98% is a, is a lot to look at. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to be willing to look beyond a person's issue and look at the whole entire picture of them. And that's what I had to come to. I had to actually see Winston for the person that some people never saw in him. And this was a man to me that once he found out that what he re really was doing was it was an addictive cycle, I saw a man that begin to work at trying to be set free from an issue that he had never really dealt with because he never knew that it was an addiction. Winston, in the book, you talk about the fact that you grew up in a church, your mom invested in you heavily with scripture and making sure you're at church, but yet toward the end of the book, you say it was your religious faith that turned it around. What was the, what, what was the key to turning it around for you? I think, first of all, I had to <clears throat> get to a point, as my wife said, to understand that I really have a problem here. It went far beyond just a man being a man and attracted to a woman and wanting to have sex with a woman. I had a real problem. Anytime that you're going beyond the bowels and, and sleeping with three or four women in a day, um, you know, 90 to 100 women a month, thousands in a year, that's not normal. Mm -hmm. So I first had to get my hands around that and grasp the fact, okay, you're doing something out of the ordinary here. This is way beyond the bounds. And even precluding that, the way I grew up was you don't have sex with anyone outside your marriage, first of all. You know, sex is, 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 is love making with the mate that you love only. So I knew right there I'd already messed up because I was doing it the wrong way outside of God's plan. And this is why when in Coach Patino's piece he talks about I don't know why he would come forward with his info. This is why I do because I feel like I'm, I'm living under a higher uh, law, if you will. It's not a law, but it's his commandment that we live a righteous life, a life of integrity. We want to thank Winston and Peggy Bennett for coming in and sharing their story. Winston's book is called Fight for Your Life. You can get your copy at TatePublishing.com or Winston has his own website. That's WinstonBennett.net. It's a story of success, setbacks, and solutions. I highly recommend it. Thanks so much for joining us this week on the Red and Blue Review. The Red and Blue Review has been brought to you by the Winton Law Group and by the Bachman Auto Group, Home Run Burgers and Fries, Sam Swope, and by SWAT Team Pest Control.